morning, everybody. God bless you. Great to see you. Great to be together today in the Lord's house. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to come over with me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And while you're headed there, I just want to remind you quickly, uh, be in prayer with us this week for Pastor Glenn as he's going to be ministering in the nation of Malaysia and also in Indonesia. So we just ask the Lord's blessing and anointing and protection on Pastor as he's there. Something exciting I want to let you know about. Uh, many of you will remember that our friend Jason Gregori is the director of a house of prayer in New Jersey called Resting Place House of Prayer. And uh, the Resting Place House of Prayer has just released their first worship album. And uh, I'm going to tell you, it's awesome. I've got it stuck in my car. Just keep playing over and over. It's better than what you got on K-Love. I'll tell you that. Oh, am I allowed to say that? I don't know. I said it anyway. Sorry. But... Uh, it's full of a lot of wonderful songs, a lot of which were actually written by Jason and his wife, Aphia, and you're going to be blessed by the anointing that's on that album, so you can pick up a copy of the CD out in the lobby, and if you're, uh, you know, too modern to uh, have CDs, if CDs a little too old school for you, you can get it on iTunes as well. And uh, we hope that you'll join us uh, this week and the next several Wednesdays for prayer meetings here in the sanctuary, and then on Wednesday, September 3rd, once we get into September, on Wednesday the 3rd, there's going to be a special congregational meeting here in the sanctuary that Wednesday. We're encouraging all of our members to attend as we just discuss and just lay out for you everything that's going on with phase two as we get ready for groundbreaking. And then we have a big day on Sunday, September 14th. We're going to have one service here Sunday morning, the 14th at 10 o'clock in the morning for our groundbreaking service. Praise the Lord. Woo. So I just want to remind you, there is not going to be a Saturday service that weekend, and uh, also there will not be any service in Stanford that weekend. Our whole church family will be here together on Sunday the 14th. We're going to dig in. We're going to dig into the ground, and uh, we're going to jump in together to the good future God has for us in our beautiful new sanctuary. Praise the Lord. All right, if you got Galatians chapter 5, let's look together. I'm going to begin reading in verse 16, Galatians 5, 16. The Apostle Paul says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are, and he's going to give you quite a list here, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Let's talk today about living a life of ever-increasing fruit ever-increasing fruit. Let's pray together and ask the Lord's blessing upon us as we look into the word today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us your holy word. We read there that forever, O Lord, your word is settled and established in heaven. Jesus said the word of God is like seed in our hearts. So we ask you to let our hearts be good soil now, soil that will receive and bear fruit from the seed of the word of God. Jesus said that the words that he speaks to us are spirit and they are life. So Holy Spirit, we invite you to come now and minister that life to us from the words of Scripture. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, we're looking together at God's letters from heaven, and we're studying messages from the apostles to the New Testament churches and letting them guide us. Over the past few weeks, we've been exploring Paul's letter to the Galatians. We've said that the Galatians were young believers who had been targeted by false religious teachers. And in this letter, the Apostle Paul is correcting them and he is challenging them to hold on to the truth of the gospel. Galatians is a very important book in the New Testament. 
It shows us how we can experience an authentic relationship with God instead of being bound by dead religion. Instead of wearing the devil's yoke of slavery, we can wear the yoke of Jesus who said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We've shared that when we received freedom in Christ, God wasn't giving us a license to sin. Instead, he was giving us the power to do what is right. And because of this, now we are free. We're free to serve God out of gratitude instead of out of compulsion, and we're free to serve one another in love. <clears throat> Over this week and next, we're going to finish our look at Galatians, and as we do that, we're going to see that Paul is getting now very practical. Up until now, Paul's been explaining salvation to us. What happens when we come to faith and how that we can lean on Jesus alone for salvation? Now, at the end of the letter, he's going to tell us how to live it out. <clears throat> Up until now, Paul's been talking about the who and the what of salvation and Christian living, but now he's going to talk about the how. Let's look today at some of the practical steps that Paul shares. And I want to say this first to anyone who's a little discouraged, perhaps, about the progress that you're making in your Christian life. If you want to live a life that's pleasing to God, a life that will cause the Son of God to say, well done, when you see him face to face. Then be encouraged today because God wants to help you to do it. If you've been a little frustrated in your fight against sin and weakness, if you want to walk in greater victory, then the Holy Spirit has a message of hope for us. If you want to know how your life can bear good fruit for God, then I want to challenge you today. God says we can walk in the Spirit. We can be led by the Holy Spirit, and in so doing, we can overcome and not give in to the things that come to tempt all of us. You can live holy, and you can enjoy the blessing that comes from living in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, before we talk about walking in the Spirit, though, we need to understand some things about this mysterious power that Paul refers to here as the flesh. You've probably heard that term, the flesh. It's often used, I think, as Christian slang, but it's an important concept in the New Testament. What is the flesh, and what does it do? I know what some of you are thinking, Pastor Nick, it's the flesh. It does whatever it wants. But let's get some Bible answers on this question. What is the flesh? First, we could see from the scripture that the flesh is not the same thing as the body. Sometimes people suggest or ask if the body itself is something evil. Is the body evil? Some philosophers did believe that the body is evil and that only the soul of man is good. But this is not a teaching of the Bible. In the Bible, the body is something good because it is a good creation of God. The Bible says that God saw everything that he had made and it was good. David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And from the moment of conception, I hope you caught that, from the moment of conception until we draw our final breath, the life in this body is something good that God has given to us and it's to be treasured. You know that in the past, some Christian theologians were actually even against the idea that we should enjoy any of the pleasures of this life. And some have even spoken against enjoying marital intimacy. But these are good gifts that have been given to us from the hand of a loving creator. A second thing to understand about the flesh is that the flesh is not the devil. The flesh is not the devil. figured I'd show you a picture of an old friend there. <laughs> the devil does a lot of bad things. Don't misunderstand me. Don't ever doubt, church, that the devil has plunged the nations into misery. But let's also be quite clear that the devil is only responsible for some of our sorrows. He cannot make us wage war. He can't make somebody steal your purse. And he definitely didn't force you to eat that red velvet cheesecake last night. <laughs> Don't worry, it's only 1,540 calories, I looked. <laughs> but you see, the devil's real power is to trick you. 
It's to deceive you into choosing an ungodly path. The Apostle James said that every person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. So you see, the devil merely takes advantage of desires that you and I already possess. Let's not give him more credit than he really deserves. We'll never be mature in Christ until we can admit that the devil is not the cause of all of our woes. Well, if it's not the body and it's not the devil, then what is the flesh? This is the third thing we need to understand. The flesh is an inward power that is within the life of man that drives us in the direction of sin. It's an inward power that exists in all of us in every human being. And it's part of the tragic inheritance we received from Adam that gets transmitted down. It's been transmitted to every successive generation. See, when the Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray, the flesh is why we wander. It's a mysterious force that we feel as a desire to walk away from God and to do what God forbids. The flesh is that impulse we know to gratify ourselves. It's the desire to preserve myself at the expense of another. The flesh is what pushes back at people when they tell us what to do. I know you don't know about that. The person next to you maybe has experienced that, but you haven't, right? It's what fuels our lifelong quest to be number one, to be on top. We can understand its pull. We've experienced its pull, even if it's not so easy to define its passions in words. You know that naive people have imagined that human beings are naturally good. Or maybe we are a blank slate. Some people believe that we are just formless clay that can be shaped into noble creatures provided we have the right environment or the right education. But as every parent has learned, nobody ever has to teach a two-year-old how to say no. If people were automobiles, then we could say that the flesh comes as standard equipment on every model that comes off the line. Another truth to understand about the flesh is this. Your battle with the flesh will be a lifelong struggle. Paul says in verse 17 that the flesh lusts against the spirit or fights it or opposes it, it means, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. The flesh is forever fighting and pushing against the voice of the Holy Spirit within us. And this is a battle from which we never get to retreat or resign. We never get an honorable discharge in that war as long as we are in these mortal bodies. Why is this the case? You know, God designed us to function in this world, and he gave us bodies that were suitable for that purpose. Man is made of more than matter. I'm not sure I could say that line again. That was tough. But Pastor Karen said relinquishment today, so that was tougher. But man is made of more than matter. We are spirit, soul, and body. See, your spirit was designed to enable you to communicate with your creator. Your soul is what allows you to be conscious of yourself. But your body was made to interact with this world through your five senses and your physical capabilities. The problem that we have is that our bodies have not yet received the fullness of redemption. We have not yet received in these bodies the fullness of what Jesus died to give us. When you trusted in Christ, thank God, the life of God came into your spirit. You became born again. The Bible says if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creature. And if you're a believer today, then God has also made some provision for your soul. Because the scriptures tell us that we've been given the word of God in order to help us renew our minds, right? The Bible says, don't be conformed to this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But when it comes to our bodies, our bodies have not yet received the fullness of what we one day will receive. 
Sometimes people say, Pastor Nick, I'm not very happy about that. Why doesn't God just give us the whole package as soon as we get saved? Wouldn't that be great? I'm tired of losing my temper. I'm tired of being addicted to, to cheesecake and all that. So, well, not too tired, really, maybe, but... There's a really long answer to that question, and it's a good question, but I think the short answer is this. Being in these weak bodies and trusting God through temptations and trials is the only way to grow in faith. And you know, the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to what? To please God. It also seems to be the case that if we were to receive the fullness of the resurrection glory in these bodies, that we would have to leave this world. That would be amazing. Imagine if everybody just flew off to heaven as soon as they got saved. Well, if that happened, there'd be nobody left here to witness to your mom or to your mean old boss. And so it seems to be the case that the church needs to be here for the time being in order to bear witness to the gospel in the world. So Paul says in Romans 8 that we are still waiting for the redemption of the body. We're still waiting to be made completely free. But thank God the Bible says that Christ will one day transform our weak bodies into glorious bodies like his that are full of the glory of the resurrection. Hallelujah. You ought to have been happier about that, but won't that be wonderful? You're going to look like you're 30 years old again. You're going to have a full head of hair in its original color palette. And you're going to be able to run like the wind. Praise the Lord. Just not today. Our bodies are headed for a glorious future. But right now, for the moment, we're still in a fight. The Bible says that while we're in this body, we are groaning. And we long to be changed because there is a power at work in us, something that is driving us in the direction of sin. And that is the power that Paul calls the flesh. A final important thing to understand about the flesh is this. Following the flesh leads us to ruin. It will lead us inescapably to ruin. The flesh produces unrighteous deeds, deeds that Paul refers to as the works of the flesh. And he lists 17 of these works that release disorder into our lives. Now, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list of sins, so don't go home and think it's okay to do something if you didn't hear it on the list today. <laughs> Paul also said, you notice, end things like these. So understand that this ugly list is just a sample of the kinds of things that the flesh produces in our lives when we allow it to do so. And in fact, there are several lists of this type in the New Testament. And they all kind of have that little etc. there on them. We all have a tendency towards those things. But I want you to hear this, church, because this is so important. But practicing those things, giving ourselves over to them, will warp our minds and our character. Let me help you here. There is a difference between stumbling there is a difference between falling into sin and practicing sin. See, when you practice sin, there's a very old-fashioned ancient English word. When you practice sin, you become wicked. Our old English word wicked is actually related to the word wicker, like a wicker chair. And both of those words originally meant they originally had something to do with the idea of being twisted. Isn't that interesting? If you think about how they make a wicker chair, that will make sense to you. So then, wickedness is when we have practiced sin to the point that it has twisted our character. Another Bible word for that same idea that we see a lot in the Old Testament is the word iniquity. It's the same idea. It is the twisted transformation of your character because of a repeated habit of sin. So if you lose your temper today, if somebody that you suspect of blindness cuts you off on 287, that does not automatically mean that you are an angry person with a character defect. But let me say this, if you give into anger on a continual basis, the more you give into anger and practice it, the more that it will begin to dominate your thinking, the more that it will begin to shape your responses and shape your reactions to situations over time that will refashion your character and you will become an angry wrathful person 
If you can't say amen, say oh my, right? We can see the same principle at work with regard to any ungodly behavior. You may fall into a sexual sin and regret it and repent. That's what happened to King David in the episode with Bathsheba. But if you practice committing sexual sin over a period of time, you will become a sexually immoral person and it will change who and what you are. Works the same with jealousy, with drunkenness, with any kind of sin. Some sins even expose us to the risk of the demonic realm breaking into our lives. And that can take our predicament to another level. One that requires more serious spiritual help, possibly even causing us to need the ministry of deliverance. Following the flesh leads to all kinds of physical and emotional problems. And it leads to spiritual darkness too. Sin is deceptive, and sin will deceive us about its consequences. And the consequences can be eternal. In verse 21 that we read, Paul warns us that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you know of a more frightening verse, let me know. In 1 Corinthians 6, he gives a similar list. But in that place, he emphasizes the deceptiveness of practicing sin and the deceptive idea that comes to teach us that there is no such consequence. And so in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, do not be deceived. They will not enter the kingdom of God. But let me repeat, Paul's not talking about a lapse, a stumbling, a falling into sin. The Greek is clear. Paul is talking about people who go on committing those things, who practice them. But church... Even if we understand that, let's beware. Let's be careful. We live in a day when even people who practice sin openly do not believe that they will be judged by God. They do not believe that they will even experience any consequences from practicing sin. Even some people who claim to follow Jesus Christ are living that way and teaching others to do the same. But the Bible is clear. Sin will separate us from God. So instead of imitating people who say that sin is safe, isn't it amazing nowadays? Oh, I practice safe sin. It's okay. <laughs> Think about it. Instead of imitating people who say that sin is safe, let us reverently fear the Lord and not deceive ourselves. Paul said, don't be deceived. Listen to the word of God when it tells us, Fools make a mockery of sin, but among the righteous, there is favor, there is grace. The flesh is a deadly power at work in our lives. It will go on opposing us until we see Jesus. But thank God there is good news in the middle of our struggle. The Holy Spirit's pointing us to a better way. It's a life of joy and peace in his presence. The Spirit of God wants to equip the people of God to bear fruit in ever-increasing measure and to see our characters be transformed, not to become twisted by sin, but to begin to resemble more and more Jesus the Son. God wants you to know that as you yield to the Holy Spirit day by day, you'll begin to look like Christ a little more day by day. Amen. How can we bring forth ever-increasing fruit instead of bringing forth the works of the flesh out of our lives? Let's look together at three key principles that are here in Galatians 5. There's three keys here to ever-increasing fruit. And the first one is this. Crucify the flesh. Crucify the flesh. See, you thought you were out of the woods there. <laughs> Crucify the flesh, Paul says, with its passions and desires. Now, let's be honest. Can we, can we be grown-ups in, in God's house today? This is old-fashioned church language that we don't hear a lot in the USA in 2014. But we need to hear it. Amen? What does it mean to crucify the flesh? Well, crucifixion, certainly, the first thing we know about it is that it was a violent act. So let's be sure about this. Paul is telling us right off the bat that we need to be merciless with sin. Have a mindset that is merciless when it comes to our sin. We must become unwilling to tolerate sin or to give it a foothold in our lives. 
we know that crucifixion was reserved for the very worst of criminals. So crucifying the flesh means that I need to think about my sin and realize that I need to see it for what it really is. I need to realize that sin cannot be bargained with. It cannot be negotiated with. It must simply be put to death. The flesh has a life of its own. It's very obvious there because Paul says your flesh has passions that it wants to live out. But we cannot leave the flesh alone to work out its desires and do its own thing. It can only be handled one way. It must be crucified. Well, the natural question then is this. How do we do that? How can we crucify an invisible power? Well, one way that we crucify the flesh, and maybe it's the most important way to begin to do so, is with repentance. With repentance. Weaken the grip of the flesh in your life by repenting of every known sin. If you have to fill a notebook with that, that's okay. You can go to CVS and buy another notebook. But repent of every known sin. Listen, when you turn from a sin and turn towards the Lord, God will give you grace in that area of your life. I'm not sure you all got that. When you turn from a sin and turn towards the Lord, God will give you grace in that area of your life where you're struggling. See, the Bible says that whoever covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes his sins will have mercy. Church, it's so important that we have a willingness, that we become willing. Everybody say willing. It's important that we develop a heart that is willing before God to turn away from everything that is called sin. Let Jesus search out and cleanse and clean your whole house, even that closet that you're afraid he's going to look in. Study your Bible. Let God change your thinking about what is really sinful. We don't have time, of course, today to do a word study on all the sins that Paul lists here, but we do need to agree, church, if we're going to grow in this way and bear fruit, we need to agree that whatever God calls sin is sin. Well, Terry, I may as well lose the rest of my friends. Cohabitation is a sin. Friends with benefits or whatever new name they're going to give it next year, is a sin, and it will ruin your life. Listen, church, let me blow your mind. God is not against sex. He invented it. <laughs> However, the Bible tells us that the marriage bed is pure. The marriage bed is pure. So, guys... If you love her, put a ring on it. <laughs> Paul also mentions sorcery or witchcraft. We call it drug abuse. The Greek word is pharmakeia, and that is where we get our English word pharmacy or pharmacist. You know, in the ancient world, drug use and the occult, witchcraft, went together. They went hand in hand, and guess what they still do today? Run from those works of the flesh, and don't encourage others to do them either. You know, on Facebook this week, I saw people liking all kinds of surprising things. Did you know that when you like a suggestive video on Facebook that your mom and your pastors can see that you liked it? I'm not sure that you knew that Facebook does that. Actually, I wasn't laughing when I saw some of what I saw. It was a little disheartening. Be willing, church. Let's be willing to be ruled by what God says. If God says it's sin, then make a quality type of decision in your spirit that you're going to agree with him about that. Crucify the flesh by fleeing from sinful situations. You know, the Bible doesn't say negotiate with fornication. It says flee fornication. You say, well, that doesn't sound very victorious. Where's the victory in running away? 
Well, if you don't like that message, then listen to the wisdom of this world. Benjamin Franklin said, if your head is made out of wax, don't walk in the sun. <laughs> That's not in the Bible, but it's true anyway. In other words, if you have a weakness in a certain area, then stay away from it. Don't expose yourself to it. If you got delivered from pornography, then you probably shouldn't launch your new evangelistic ministry down at the strip club. <laughs> Crucify the flesh by avoiding friends who pull you down. The Bible says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Part of counting the cost of following Jesus is realizing that you may lose friends. It may not be possible for you to run anymore with your old crew. Bad company corrupts good morals, Grandma said. And you know what? That's in the Bible, too. The Bible says that. Most people I know would never jump off a cliff. But I've known many people who would let a friend push them off it. Do you know what I mean? Crucify the flesh and don't baby it. Don't tolerate its tendencies. Romans 13, 14 says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, put on his life like a garment and make no provision, meaning make no accommodation, make no allowance for the flesh in order to fulfill its lust. Don't make excuses for it. Don't accommodate it in any way. Don't pamper your flesh. Jesus said, if your eye is causing you to stumble, pluck it out. Now, he didn't mean to do that literally, so I don't want to see a lot of pirates in here next week, you know, eye patches. But maybe what we could do is to get rid of some things that we shouldn't be looking at in the first place. Crucify the flesh. Learn how to handle temptations like Jesus did with the word of God. Respond like Jesus by saying, it is written. The Bible says that there's no temptation that has overtaken you except temptations that are common to man. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to bear. But with that temptation, he will also make, this is God's promise, with that temptation, he will make a way of escape for you so that you will be able to bear up under it. Praise the Lord. That would be a good one to memorize if you memorize scripture. And if you don't memorize scripture, you ought to. God will help you when you're tempted if you call upon his name and face temptations with his word. Crucify your flesh by remembering that you belong to Jesus now. You no longer belong to or are under the dominion of your fleshly impulses. Remember that you now have power from God in your inner man to serve God. Those impulses are no longer who you are and who you have to be. Paul said those who are Christ's, those who belong to Christ, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Jesus said, if we love him, we will keep our commandments. That's the key. Way back in Genesis, Joseph told that adulterous woman that was coming after him, he said, how could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? See, Joseph had made a commitment in his spirit to love and serve God. And so because of that, uh, he did not want to commit that sin. But not only that, he did not even want to allow his passions to become inflamed to the point where he might end up at the end of that road. Well, here's a necessary and important question then. What happens when I do blow it? What happens when I do stumble, as we all do? Simple advice. When you fall... Turn back and repent to God right away. When you do sin, listen to the Spirit's voice. The Holy Spirit will be nudging you to come back to God. He's not the condemning voice in your heart that tells you that it's time to write this guy off. He's the voice that will be nudging you to return to God. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, confess means to agree, to say the same thing about my sin that God says. When we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank God. Remember, church, when you confess your sin is not when God finds out about it. It's when you get rid of it. 
The Bible warns us about our hearts. The Bible warns us that if we're not careful, our consciences can become seared, can become calloused as if they were burned with a hot iron. So we need to quickly turn back to the Lord when we hear his voice calling us back to the throne of grace so that our hearts will always stay tender and soft and responsive to the Holy Spirit. But let me encourage you, if you are praying about your struggle, if you're not giving into it, if you're fasting, if you're crying out to God, if you're hating that sin, then you are not going to end up practicing that thing. You are going to experience the victory. Praise the Lord. Sometimes people say, well, why doesn't God just take away a sinful desire that I may have? Well, sometimes he does. I think many of us have heard testimonies or experienced it ourselves when God has removed, seemingly supernaturally taken away a desire from us. Sometimes he does do that, but sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes we need to wrestle with that thing and we need to crucify the flesh in that area until it becomes too weak to drag us down anymore. Sometimes the Father is teaching us to grow by leaning on him and that's how he's going to make you to become an overcomer. Let's keep our flesh in that crucified position by having a fervent love for the Father, by being radically committed to pleasing him. Are we willing to treat our sin, all of it, as an enemy, an enemy that we will not make excuses for or negotiate with? If your answer is yes, you will experience the victory that comes from the Holy Spirit. How do we live a life of ever-increasing fruit? First, crucify the flesh. Secondly, this, take the Holy Spirit as your companion. Take the Holy Spirit as your companion. Paul says, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's good news. The flesh is fighting against the spirit, but the spirit is also making war against the voice of your flesh. Crucifying the flesh is serious business, as you just heard for 20 minutes. But the other side of the coin is something wonderful, something fantastic, and that is growing in a daily partnership with the Holy Spirit. What an awesome privilege that God himself, think about it, has come to live inside of us. Jesus told his disciples, the Holy Spirit is with you and he shall be in you. When we come to faith in Christ, the Spirit comes to live within us. He comes to be my friend and he comes to be my daily companion. Paul says, walk in the Spirit. The Christian life is often called a way or a road or a walk. Why is that? It's because walking is our most common activity. It's a picture of how, as human beings, with two feet, we move from one thing to the next. So walking in the Spirit just simply means that we are moving through our day together with the Holy Spirit who is accompanying us. This is one of those disciplines in our Christian lives that I, I think we're all familiar with that seems to be both easy and hard at the same time. But as we go through our days, we can develop some habits that I like to call habits of friendship with the Holy Spirit. And as we grow in friendship with him, the Holy Spirit will teach us things. He'll show us things. He will help us in situations that we encounter throughout the day. Jesus said he's the helper. You know, we often think, I believe, we, we think about our relationship with the Holy Spirit improperly. I think many people think of the Holy Spirit just as a power, kind of as if he were just fuel for the Christian life. But we don't just fill up on the presence of the Holy Spirit by praying in the morning. I think that's the wrong way to think about it. See, the Holy Spirit is not a gas station. He's not a filling station. He is not just fuel. He's your traveling companion. Now let's be clear. We're Pentecostal people here, and hopefully you are getting filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. But that supernatural filling of the Holy Spirit in your spirit is to give you his supernatural power and boldness. So getting filled with the Spirit in that sense is, isn't quite, I, I think it isn't quite the right picture to use if we want to understand the role of the Holy Spirit in my daily life. Remember what I said, he's not your fuel, he's your traveling companion. To walk in the Spirit, we need to learn to talk with him like a friend. The Holy Spirit is the greatest friend that you and I have. Learn to speak with him conversationally the same way that you talk to Jesus. How do we do this? Well, first, make the Spirit your prayer partner. 
Ask him to lead you in your prayers. Bring him into your seasons of prayer and let him start directing your prayer life. Make the Holy Spirit your teacher. Every time you read the word of God, every time you open your Bible, invite him to come into that time with you. Ask him to help you understand what you're reading. When you're in school and you're reading Shakespeare, you can't talk to Shakespeare. He can't tell you what Romeo and Juliet were really saying back and forth to each other. But the Bible is a supernatural book that has a supernatural author, but you can read it with supernatural revelation from the person who wrote it. Converse with the Holy Spirit throughout the day. Include him in things as you would include any friend. You'll begin to notice if you do that that he's guiding you and he's giving you wisdom. Jesus said the Holy Spirit was meant to be another person of the same kind as him sent to be with you every day. Imagine, how many of you would raise a hand and say, it would be really cool if you could hang out with Jesus all day tomorrow? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be awesome to be able to hang out with Jesus all day and talk with him? Well, Jesus said, there's something better than that. He said, if I go away, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. He said, it's better for you if I go away, because if I don't go away, I won't send him. But if I do go back to the Father, I will send you the Spirit so that he may remain with you forever. He will be your friend. He will be your advocate, your counselor, and your standby. When we look back in the book of Acts, we can see that it was normal for people to have fellowship with the Spirit like that. In every chapter, in almost every chapter of the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit was guiding and leading the disciples. He was showing them the future. He was telling them what was going to happen. He was telling them what city to go and preach to, giving them every kind of guidance in their life. Using Paul's language, we would say that those people were able to serve God successfully because they were being led by the spirit so here's our problem in the modern church folks we we've, we've been running on only two-thirds of God we love Jesus and we love the father now let's take the spirit as our friend as well I think you'll find that he's the best friend you've ever had live a life of pursuing him in prayer and fellowshipping with him throughout the day we had a great message here this past Wednesday as we wrapped up our summer pulpit series. Our, our friend Brad Whipple was here. You ought to get a copy of that message. Pastor Brad said, spending time with God brings love and effectiveness. Isn't that great? Spending time with God brings love and effectiveness. And as we live a life of pursuing him, his life will invade and pervade our lives. It will begin to transform us. Ask him every day to transform you, to let his life flow out of yours. See, when we give ourselves over to the flesh, the flesh just does what flesh does. It will produce works of evil in our life. But when we have communion with the Holy Spirit, something different begins to happen inside of us. The beautiful nature of the Spirit, the character of Jesus begins to be seen in me. My motivations, my thoughts, my responses to things are no longer the responses of the flesh. They are the responses that Jesus himself would give in that situation. When we're wounded, as all of us are going to be as we're passing through this life, our response will no longer be vengeance, but forgiveness. Just like Stephen when he was being persecuted, instead of wishing vengeance and getting even, you'll hear yourself saying things like, Father, don't put this sin to their account. Instead of jealousy and anger, you'll notice that different things are growing out of your spirit now. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, gentleness, and all the rest. Those are the fruit of the Spirit. They're the natural outgrowth of walking with him, listening to his voice, and obeying what he's telling us to do. It comes from following his impulses instead of those gross and self-satisfying urges of the flesh. The more that we give heed to his whispers, the more that the beautiful nature of Jesus will appear within us. Your ways, your motivations, and your reactions become those of Jesus. And when that happens, in a very mysterious way, Jesus, the Lord, becomes visible here again on this earth. He can be seen in your hands. He can be heard. His glory can be heard in your voice. He can be seen in the love in your eyes. His presence, his heart can be heard in the words of your lips because his life is growing within you and people will see Jesus and his beauty in you.
Invite him to rule your heart moment by moment. Walk in the spirit throughout the day and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. How do we live a life of ever increasing fruit? First, crucify the flesh. Second, take the Holy Spirit for your companion. And finally this, trust in God to make you like Christ. Trust in God to make you like Christ. Trust that God will change you. He will change you into the likeness of the Son. Worship team, you can come back and help us, please. How many of you have experienced the truth that the Christian life is not something that is instantaneous? Are you with me? Although there are some wonderful changes that happen right away when we come to Christ, there is no such thing as microwave Christianity. Be great if there were, right? Paul says, walk in the Spirit. He does not say, sprint in the Spirit. Church, don't be discouraged by the process of growth. Don't be discouraged by the fact that sometimes when we look at ourselves, we don't seem to be attaining what we want to attain. That we don't seem to have the holiness or the kindness. We just seem to mess up a lot. Don't be discouraged by that, by that process of growth, because it is a process. When we come to faith in Christ, it's certainly true, absolutely true, that we are accepted by God right away. Because of the blood of Jesus that he shed on the cross, the Bible says that we have received the adoption. And thank God we are daughters and sons of God because of what Jesus has done. But the process of sanctification... The process that means of growing to become increasingly like Jesus, that is a process of transformation that will stretch across my entire life. So don't be disheartened by that, but trust in God. We need to trust him. If you don't hear anything else, hear this. We need to trust him for fruit the same way that we trusted him to save us in the first place. We need to have confidence in him, have confidence that God is committed to the process of changing us. He is committed to the process of taking you from glory to glory. He's committed to taking you from one level of beauty and radiance in Jesus to the next. He's committed to seeing you take on the image and likeness of his son. You know, the flesh produces works that are manifest, meaning that they are obvious. And I can tell you that they are quickly produced, aren't they? But you know, it's no accident that the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts is described as fruit. Why? Because fruit takes time. You know that even a good tree can take a few years before it starts to produce some fruit for the first time. I want you to follow me here. We're almost done. Follow me here. Works of the flesh come forth quickly and easily. Gifts of the Spirit are given. They are gracious gifts of God. That's why supernatural gifts, or looking like you have supernatural gifts, are not a good test of spiritual maturity because they're just gifts from God that He distributes. But fruit is different because fruit is grown. God said in His Word that His people would bud and blossom and fill the face of of the world with fruit. What an interesting process, God says. God says his people would bud and blossom and fill the face of the earth with fruit. See, that is a process, but it is a process that is good. It's a process that's worth the wait, and we will grow as we cooperate with the Holy Spirit to get there. So don't be discouraged if your progress in holiness, if your progress in becoming like Jesus seems a little bit slow sometimes. Continue on with him because you're going to make it. Turn to your neighbor and say, I think you're going to make it. Trust the Holy Spirit to show you when you've missed it and when you're starting to wander a little bit. See, the Bible says that he who began a good work in you, he will continue to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I know the one that I have believed in and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed. What have you committed to the Lord? Your heart, your plans, your dreams, your hopes, your future. Paul says, he is able. I am persuaded that he is able to keep the things that I have committed to him until that day. 
Jude said it in his letter. See, it's all over the New Testament, that word of encouragement to stay the course. Jude said he is able to keep you from falling and he is able to present you before the presence of his glory. How? Not just barely making it. He is able to present you before the presence of his glory faultless and with exceeding joy. If you trust in him for transformation, you are going to see those changes that you've been wanting to see in your heart over time. And you too are going to bear, you're going to shine with the countenance of Jesus himself upon you. Let's commit within our hearts again today, church, to serve the Lord with a whole heart. Let's commit to bearing abundant fruit for him. And if you've wandered away from God today, today is a really good day to come home to the Father's house. You need to know that God promises us in his word that if we return to him, he will receive us like a loving father. You can begin to walk in his ways once again and experience the delights of living in Father's house. How can we live a life of ever-increasing fruitfulness? First, crucify that flesh with its passions and desires. Secondly, make sure that you're taking the Holy Spirit as your daily, even your constant companion. Then finally, trust God for the personal transformation that you've been seeking in your heart. Trust Him that He's going to cause you to bear the likeness of Jesus. If we live in the Spirit, Paul says, then let us also walk in the Spirit so that we can live a life together of ever increasing fruit. Amen. Come on, let's stand together and let's give some thanks to the Lord today. Come on.